Hello from the Forstronics YouTube channel. Welcome to Advanced PWM for the Arduino Zero and really any Arduino running the SAM D21 chip, which is the Atmel, it's an ARM-based processor, but the SAM D21, which is found on the Zero, it's found on the M0, and it's also found on the MK1000. You know, Arduino provides a library for pulse width modulated modulation, but it really doesn't offer a lot of uh, advanced features or, yeah, more advanced features. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to use some of the uh, SAM libraries out there and do some more advanced things with the pulse width modulation on there. Also, Forstronics.com has Arduino boards on there for sale. So we're going to start off with the Arduino Uno, the flagship Arduino board, and the somewhat new Arduino MK1000. So the MK1000 is pretty cool because it has built-in Wi-Fi, it has a built-in lithium-ion polymer battery charger, small form factor. It's really targeted at IoT applications. So they're authentic Arduino boards. They're for sale. They'll be at MSRP for the rest of the summer of 2016. I'm going to have a discount for a dollar off each board. So if you need a new Arduino, why not buy it from me? If you like the content that I put out, buy these from Forstronics.com. You'll help me generate more and better content. All right, let's get started. Okay, what will we cover in this video? I already mentioned some of it's any Arduino that has the SAM D21 chip, how to set up pulse width modulated signals using a generic clock. Generic clocks are real cool because you can kind of set up this clock for whatever frequency you want to be and then you can use it for timing purposes in other modules on the D D21 board, including pulse width modulation. We'll talk about how to calculate you know, your pulse width modulation frequency, your pulse width and resolution based on the pulse width modulation settings you're using. Then we're going to look at an example how to dynamically change the frequency and pulse width of the signal using periodic interrupts. So this is great for areas such as motor control or power electronics when you want to control the switching of MOSFETs where you can actually do other stuff in your program but keep a nice time-synced dynamic capabilities to change your signal as needed. Okay, here's the block diagram of the pulse width um, well, they call it the timer counter for control applications. And so this is really just a timer counter and it allows you to generate what they'll call advanced waveforms as well as pulse width modulation waveforms. Now, th these are only square waveforms. You know, for instance, you can use the, the DAC to generate more random or I'll say non-square, you know, sinusoidal or whatever waveforms. The advantage of this over the, the DAC is the DAC only does 300,000 samples per second. This can go much faster. It basically can go as fast as the clock in some cases. So what are we looking at here? And I'm not going to go into great detail, but we set up our generic clock and then we're going to define a frequency or a period, I should say. And this period will set this counter. So what happens is you have this clock running, this counter will count up and then at some point when it reaches the end, it'll start over. But the counter counts in sequence with the clock. So you have the clock frequency, then based on the counter value you choose, let's say you choose 100, that's going to determine the frequency of your waveform. So clock frequency, let's say it's 10 megahertz. Your counter is set for 100. That's going to divide that down to what? 100 kilohertz. So you'd have a 100 kilohertz waveform, essentially. You can also use a prescaler to further divide it down. Then what happens is that this counter compares itself to these registers. And so we're more concerned with the match register because this register, CCX, will then, once there's a match, so if, let's say this is set for 100, the counter, and CCX is set for 50, that means we're going to have a 50% duty cycle. So half the time that, that this is counting, you'll have an output high and the other half you have an output low. Which comes first, output high or low, depends on some other settings that I'm, that I'm not going to cover, but I'll show an example in my code. So the counter counts up, let's say it's high at first. Once a match is, occurs, let's say it's at 50, this will then go low. So you'll have a, a, you know, a, a perfectly symmetrical waveform with 100 kilohertz frequency. And of course you can change the frequency and, and things like that. You can then choose how that signal is routed out of what output. What else is nice is you can generate interrupts. And this is the one we're more concerned with, the OVF interrupt. 
Because what can happen is that interrupt can occur at the end or beginning or middle of this counter and you can then change something. Could be something, nothing to do with, with this, these blocks or you can change the CCX value or your period value so you can dynamically change the frequency and um, the duty cycle. And, and this is sort of glitch free. You can do it without causing any sort of sudden glitches in the system. Or wh when I say glitches, I should say sudden waveform jumps. It does it smooth, these changes are done smoothly. Okay, here I wanted to show an example of the pulse width modulation mode we'll be in, or operation they're calling it. Uh, so we're gonna show an example in single slope. So there's different setups you can do to match your application, but if you understand one, you can kind of figure out the rest. So what's happening in single slope is, remember how I said the counter, you set the counter based on you know your clock and your 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 counter counts in in step with the clock so what this line is showing is the counter so the counter starts at zero and it counts up to what they call top so that's your basically your period and then it starts over here is your ccx register so what happens is you're starting let's say you're starting with a high this is the output your counter starts and then all of a sudden there's a match in the ccx register then that tells the output or triggers the output to go to a different value. So here it goes low. Here's your full period, it starts over. Here the match happens at zero, CCX is set for zero, so this never goes high, it stays low, counts back up, and then uh, it's high again. Uh, you have a match, it goes low, uh, so on and so forth. And I'll show you in the code how we can actually generate an interrupt at these top values. Then they also give you, and this is all from the data sheet, if I didn't say that, the, the SAM D21 chip. Then here's how you can calculate sort of the resolution, the frequency, and the pulse width based on this mode of operation. Now, different operations have slightly different calculations. For instance, there's a dual mode, which I'll, I'll show briefly. But for frequency, this, this is the generic clock, which I'll show you how to set up in the code. But you basically have the generic clock then you have top, which is your top counter value, plus one because you're counting zero, two. And so then you have N. So let's say top is 99, plus one would be 100. Let's say our clock is 10 megahertz. Let's say this is N is the prescaler. So let's say the prescaler is set to one. That means our frequency is going to be 100 kilohertz. And pulse width, once again, there's the prescaler, which we're just going to assume is one. Here's top. Here's your... your uh, CCX and divided by frequency will give you the pulse width. And then resolution, what resolution means is essentially, this calculation is kind of dumb because your resolution is essentially what your top value is plus one. So it's whatever you set the period to because these are log base two. So this just turns out to be one. And so it's really just, I shouldn't say that, then you're really just taking the log of top plus one. Okay, here's the setup we're going to use for our, our uh, example. Here's an Arduino Zero. I'm going to use an Arduino Zero, but you can use any sort of Arduino with the, any SAM D21 board with the Arduino bootloader. Uh, I'm going to use D, D3 for the pulse width modulation output. And I essentially have it connected to a scope uh, to show you the output. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use analog pin A0 and A1. And so I have two 10K potentiometers, so I have VCC at, at one end and then I have the other end tied to ground. And so what happens is when I move my potentiometer, I'm adjusting the resistance of this arm and I have this arm tied to the analog pin. So as I move it, the voltage value at this analog pin changes and I'm going to use that to change the pulse width of my signal, which is going to be tied to A0, and the frequency of my signal. A1, and I'll do that dynamically using an interrupt. So let's look at the example in action first, and then we'll look at the code. Okay, here's my setup. Here is my Arduino Zero. Here's my two potentiometers, and I have them tied to the analog pins. Here's the analog pins. Here's VCC, and here is my pulse width modulation output, which I have connected to a scope probe. Here's my little screwdriver that I'm going to use to adjust my potentiometers. Here's actually an MK1000 board. I just put that there in the background. This also has a SAM D21 chip and I'll be selling it on my site. So let's see the, 
example in action. So here's our setup. You can see the scope probe. You can see my terrible camera work. I pick up the screwdriver. Let's stop it there. On my scope, you can see the current output, uh, you know, the square wave output at a certain frequency and a certain pulse width. You're going to see me turn this. And if you watch the screen, you can see the pulse width change up and down. So on this next one, I'm going to change the frequency. So watch this frequency. You can watch the reading here. The frequency changes as I move it. So higher frequency and lower frequency. So there's the example. So let's look at the code on how we did that. So here is the code on our example. Here I start off with some initial settings, the period, and, and when I say period, this is gonna be essentially the counter. Remember, the counter counts up from, from zero to top. Well, this is top, 255. It's just the initial top value. Then here's my pulse width duty cycle. I have it at 0.5, which essentially means 50%. For my generic clock, I have a division factor of four. I'll talk about that. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm choosing ge generic clock four, which I'll show you. And then my divide factor for the generic clock. Remember, the generic clock's a, a clock we can set and then use it somewhere else. It's our little clock to sort of play with, but it has to be based off of the main clock, which for the zero is 48 megahertz. So I have a divide factor of three. That means my generic clock is going to be 16 megahertz. I could have just a one here and have it actually be 84, excuse me, 48 megahertz. So I set up my pin mode. I, what I do here is I set my analog read resolution to eight bits. So that means 255. And why I did that is so it matches my max period setting. Okay, now here's some stuff, it's probably new, and, and this leverages calls from the Sam D21 library that Atmel made, and you don't have to do a library call to it. You can, as long as you have the latest Arduino, you can use these, these functions and they'll compile. So here's where I'm setting up the generic clock. So I, I set my division factor, and I also tell them what generic clock I wanna use, and I'm gonna use four. Then there's this uh, thing process where you wait for uh, synchronization. And you know what, actually I wanna do something real quick before I continue, before I forget. I did leverage some of this code uh, from Martin L on the Arduino forum. Uh, so I do wanna make sure I give him credit, but on this Arduino forum link, he, did, he does some examples with, with pulse width modulation and I did directly leverage some of that. So I just wanna make sure I point that out. Okay, uh, here's some other settings for the generic clock. Um, you know, I set the source, I select the clock again, or you just have to state what, what clock you're using these settings for is what I really should say. Then you wait for it to synchronize. All you're doing here is waiting for these settings to take, to take hold before you continue. This part's a little confusing. This is where I set the pin. So you sort of have to route the signal to a certain port and then to a certain pin on that port using the MUX. So I actually have two examples here. One goes to D7 and one goes to D3. I'm using the one that goes to D3. Then what I do is I say I want to use the generic clock for TCC0. And TCC0 is going to be the timer counter that I use to generate the waveform. So I'm, I'm basically saying the clock source for TCC0 TCC is going to be generic clock four. Then here's where I set my waveform operation or mode for normal mode, or I, I should say, not normal mode, a uh, single slope mode. And that's what I'm doing here. Now I commented out some things. So here's another mode. This is um, dual slope using two interrupts. So this is just an example of how to do dual slope that uses an interrupt at both top and bottom. This line right here will change the polarity of your waveform. Okay, here's where I set the initial frequency, uh, excuse me, let me say period. So this is, remember, the W period is 255. So I'm saying for every clock cycle, you count one, two, three, all the way up to 255. That's one complete waveform. Then you start over again because we're in single slope mode. Here's where I set the, the duty cycle. So I'm taking that 
that float value, which was 0.5, I'm multiplying it by 255 to get half of 255, which remember, this is the CCX register. So this tells it when to change from one level zero to VCC or VCC to zero. Here's where I enable the interrupt and I wanna use the OVF interrupt. And this is basically means an interrupt is gonna happen every time the counter reaches its top value. I then call this function to enable the interrupts and I'll show you that. I then basically set the prescaler and enable the the timer counter. So I'm basically saying, okay, now start generating the waveform here. And you can also control the frequency here with the prescaler. I, I don't have a need to do that, so I just set the prescaler to a value of one. Okay, here's my main loop. I, I'm not going to have any code, but you, I mean, you normally would put your regular code here. And then uh, here's just that interrupt function that was up there. What I'm doing is setting the priority. So I'm saying, you, you, on the D21, you can have a lot of different interrupts going. I'm saying that this interrupt is the highest priority, so don't let any interrupts get in front of this one. This one should always activate on cycle. Here, I'm just enabling uh, the interrupt. Then I have my interrupt handler, so the ISR stands for interrupt service routine. So maybe I should say what an interrupt is. I do have a video on interrupts, but basically an interrupt is a timed you know, event or triggered asynchronous event that happens where immediately the chip will jump to that code. So it doesn't matter where we are in the loop, what's activating, it'll freeze what's happening, jump to this interrupt service routine, which is down here, do this service routine, then continue on to where it was in the loop. So that's what's so great about this. And here's my interrupt handling. I get my reading, my, my period reading from analog read so it can either be 0 or 255 I wait for it to set and then here's where I set my um, pulse width I have my analog read I divide it by 255 and then I multiply it by a1 to get you know whatever duty cycle I want and then here I have to reset the flag if you don't do this your interrupt won't keep happening so think about what's happening here. So anytime I would change the, the potentiometer with the screwdriver, I would, and this interrupt would happen at the end of the count, that change would then immediately be imp implemented into the, the timer counter or the pulse width modulation signal and be adjusted. And so that, you know, depending on the period of, of my setting, let's say it's, you know, 100 kilohertz or something like that, any little turn is going to be detected because we're now working on a microsecond or a millisecond scale. Uh, so, it, so it looks like it's happening in real time, essentially. Now you might say, well, why not just put this code here in the loop and you would get that same, same effect. But the point here is assuming, you know, you're using this in a, a sketch or a program that has a lot of different code and you can't tell exactly the timing, th this interrupt's going to uh, enable that to, to make sure that you get the correct timing so changes to the frequency or to the pulse width will take effect immediately. Okay, that's it for this video on pulse width modulation on the SAM D21 chip, some of the advanced features. If you feel I missed anything or, or anything to add, uh, please suggest it in the comments. And as a reminder, I do have authentic Arduino Unos and Arduino MK1000s on Forstronics.com. I'm going to be adding more products all July and August of 2016. I'm going to be also adding more Arduino boards in the future. So if you like my content and you need an Arduino board, please go to my site, buy one. Thank you for watching.